Welcome to the Dern Vet Podcast, where pet skin is always in. I'm Dr. Ashley Bourgeois, board-certified veterinary dermatologist, skin nerd, and your go-to guide for everything itchy, smelly, and inflamed. I'm here to take the itch out of your day and make derm more fun than frustrating. Grab your microscope and let's focus in. Welcome to another episode of the Derm Vet Podcast, either in your ears, if you are listening on any of the apps that play podcasts, or your ears and your eyes if you're joining me here on YouTube version of the podcast today. It is September, and for me, I am literally recording this on the first day of school for my kids. So so I thought what would be fun is to go over what are the things I've learned or changed or adjusted the last few years, you know, going off that school concept. I think it's really important that we're always growing, progressing. You hear me mention a lot of new products, a lot of new techniques here on the podcast, and that's one of the things that keeps me the most interested in my field as a dermatologist is what's coming out, what's new, because I do deal with very difficult chronic cutaneous issues, ear issues. We still have cases that we struggle to control. You know, I still have cases that I am actively getting consults from my own fellow colleagues on because we struggle with cases just like you do. And I think that's some of the most exciting things, right? Just to know that we progress in our field, that we have new stuff that comes out, that we learn more about certain disease processes that maybe we didn't know 10 years ago. I would feel really stagnant if I didn't progress and grow or change my way of thinking or try new things. So I want to go over four things that I've kind of adjusted, learned, you know, fine-tuned over the last, let's just say, few years. You've heard me talk about some of these things on the podcast before, but in the spirit of education and being in the fall and kind of that new feeling in the air, I wanted to go over some things that came to mind to me that I've learned or changed or adjusted. So number one thing that I've learned or changed in the last few years is being a bit more thoughtful of recommending skin supplements or skin supportive diets in my atopic patients. So I've never been necessarily against supplements, but if you even listen back to the podcast, like you know, four or five years ago, I mentioned that I didn't really use them or recommend them. And it's not that I was against them, but it's just that I have patients doing a lot of stuff, right? My patients are bathing and they're giving medications and potentially immunotherapy. So I wouldn't really think to add on things like a skin supportive diet. And I don't mean like a food allergy. Of course, I believe in working up food allergy. I mean, for atopic patients, I get to the end of the food trial, they ask like, what do you want to me to feed my dog. And, you know, I just mentioned like whatever is AFCO supported, but I've changed my tune a little bit and I don't want to paint the picture that I put every single patient on a supplement because I don't. But the reason I've been more open to it is one, we have some supplements that have really good, nice research behind them. And that's my first question as a clinician, right? What proof do you have? And a lot of supplements out there don't have much. And I've been approached by them. I've been approached by companies to say, hey, we'll give you this, you know, money or this exposure to talk about a product. And the first question I ask is, what research do you have? Because I don't want to put my, you know, name behind anything that doesn't actually have research behind it. So I want to see the research. I want to see the proof before I put it in my own dog or any of my patients. But there are some that actually have some really good research and proof. And the reason that I've jumped a bit more into considering, hey, being proactive about saying we could do the skin supplement, we could do this skin supportive diet, is that a lot of my clients come in on them. So they're spending their money on these supplements that don't have a lot of literature behind them. So if they want to do that, I want to be proactive and guide them. Like, are you interested in a supplement? Is it something that you'd want to do? So I have been more proactively using them. I would say the ones that I'm more aware of that have research behind them, you've heard me mention them before. Um, Nutramax has Dermaquin, which was actually just reformulated, not only to have the hardy kiwi and all the other ingredients it had before, but also to add in PEA. And they've also changed the dosing on it. So you don't do an induction and then go down to maintenance. Now you just stay on that higher uh, dose. 
And so that's one that I really like using a lot. And I find that most of my dogs and cats find it palatable. Uh, and then Decra has Retinol Ultra. I believe just the dog formula now, I think the cat formula has gone. Um, but again, really good research with PEA in it uh, that it can help to stabilize things, help reduce things like histamine release. So there definitely could be others out there. Those are the ones that I am more familiar with that have research behind them that actually show things like benefiting the skin support, lessening doses of medication. And that's always a thing that I'm looking for. And then diets, again, ones that can support the skin and atopic patients. Mostly these are dogs. I'm not aware of really any out for cats. Uh, of course, Royal Canin has Skin Topic, which is just released a few years ago has studies through the University of Zurich that actually shows it can help reduce things like the amount of medications that they're using, uh, that they, it's supporting the skin, the skin looks better and healthier. And then Hills has Derm Complete, which can be used to uh, look at food allergy because it is an egg-based protein, which is more novel. But then also it can be great for dogs with atopic disease because, again, it has things that help support the skin barrier, reduce histamine release. Uh, then you have ones that have been around for a while, like Prina uh, DRM. Uh, historically, even using joint diets like Hills JD, if they have arthritis too, right? You've got those high fatty acids that could help the skin. But the two that are newer that have been out um, the last few years that have good literature behind them that I have been using uh, is Hills Derm Complete and then Royal Canin Skin Topic. So just think about that. If you have patients that are not fully controlling on pharmaceuticals or owners are asking about, hey, are there diets out there that could support the skin of my dog with environmental allergies? that there are options that actually have literature and research behind them, which is great. Number two thing that I have learned more, and this has actually probably been in the last year and been doing a lot more of in the clinic. I had done it a little bit years ago when I practiced in California, but now I've been doing a lot of it here in Oregon, and that is venomous insect testing. This is a little bit of a teaser because we are actually going to have a whole episode on venomous insect testing coming up next week with Dr. Ewing, um, and we really dive into it. He's done a lot of research into it, um, and it's actually been very supportive of me as I've been starting to do a lot more of this. I want to recognize not every dermatologist does this, but something that we uh, do in our clinic and through various Southern California clinics with our company, Animal Dermatology Group. And that is actually looking for those dogs who collapse when they get stung by a bee or, you know, get a swollen face or get urticaria. And we're concerned that the more they get exposed in the future, they could get worse and worse. And that's actually a life threatening thing. So this is different than skin testing for environmental allergy immunotherapy. This is actually testing for things like honeybee being the most common one. Um, but I've recently had a dog that was positive to wasp. Uh, we look at hornet, yellow jacket. So these dogs that truly, it's usually young dogs that start developing these scary reactions. We can test them. You'll learn all about it on a future episode of the podcast. And we can actually desensitize them. But it's a different protocol. It's not one that we can have owners do at home, but it has a very, very high success rate. So it's been really cool to be able to offer that. Where I live in the Pacific Northwest, people are outdoors, hiking a lot. You know, we're a very outdoor area. So it provides a sense of relief for owners who've had that scary moment where their dog collapses, that, you know, they're afraid they're going to die we can actually try to desensitize them to provide them some comfort in a life. And there's a pretty high success rate. Of course, nothing's ever foolproof, but knowing that we can give an option to manage these dogs to lessen their sensitivity long-term is great. So I'm not, not going to dive too much into it because we're going to learn all about it next week on the podcast and really dive into it with Trent. But it has been a really cool thing. I've been seeing a lot of new patients for it. I think as the word gets out, especially to our ER clinic, that we offer it. Um, it's been really great to offer this. Number three, how to up my game. 
This is really to me around how I've been managing immunotherapy or allergy testing my patients with atopic dermatitis or feline atopic skin syndrome. You know, you've heard me talk about IV fluorescein testing in cats. That's been something that's really wonderful that we can enhance the positives that we get uh, within cats that have atopic disease. Again, I want to recognize not everyone does this. We all practice differently, but something that more and more of us have started doing because poor cats don't tend to pop up their skin test that well. So we are able to enhance our reactions by giving IV fluorescein. I often combine that with a serum panel, but then I kind of get a full scope of what that cat's immune system's doing. We're quite limited on what we have for cats, so I want to maximize any chance I have to get a better response to formulate my immunotherapy. So that is one. Number two is I've been, this has been around for a while, but I kind of fell off offering it for a bit. And now I'd say in the last like six months, I've really started offering it to my, you know, not as nervous, well-behaved dogs and cats. And that is something called rush immunotherapy. I've talked a little bit about this on my social media, but it's a protocol where we can just get them started faster with injectable immunotherapy. I did this with my own dog when I started her, but we place an IV catheter. We have a protocol where we give injections throughout the day. They get TPRs, temperature, pulse, rest respiration every 30 minutes so we can monitor for reactions, which is quite rare for them to have. But then they don't have to go through that very slow buildup, which can take a couple of months, depending on your protocol. So our hope is that they actually respond faster, that we can hasten, right? And we know therapy takes a long time to work. So we're hoping that we can make it work a bit quicker. So the rush immunotherapy, I do like to make sure they'll tolerate being in the clinic. It's a lot to get poked and TPR'd every 30 minutes. So making sure that they'll tolerate that uh, behaviorally and it's not going to be too stressful for them. But if they can um, and it's within the owner's budget, it is a great option. And I've been you know, surprised how many of my owners really like that as an option versus doing everything at home to start. So Rush immunotherapy, doing IV fluorescein testing, and then just making sure we know there's different forms of immunotherapy, like the injectable, sublingual. We know the efficacy rate is very similar between the two. So really asking owners, what's going to work for you? What's uh, more beneficial? What can actually be given long term is not going to ruin your relationship with your pet. And then we've actually been implementing topical immunotherapy as an option. It's a newer option that there are clinics. uh, They can use a cream once a day, usually rub it on the concave portion of the pinna. And that is something that can be another option that can be beneficial for clients. So not as widely available as the others, but something at least with our clinics that we have seen um, some good response to. And there has been recent literature to support how it stimulates the immune system. And then finally, the last one, which I've done in a whole episode on, but I keep learning how to educate my clients better and better about this, is how to be proactive, not just reactive with allergy management. So it is setting my clients up for success, that they know what a flare looks like. They know what an infection can look like. I have tools at home for them or instructions at home for them to know how to attack that early. So they are their chronic ear dog. We flush with something like a maintenance product, like, you know, my cellar, uh, epiotic, something that can be, you know, given all the time to help clean out the ear. But they know if they start to see red odor to maybe switch to a different product that has chlorhexidine or flush more often. You know, for the skin, right, that's easy to see. So they're doing pretty well. I bathe them with something like a maintenance shampoo. I don't need chlorhexidine all the time, but they have a chlorhexidine product at home, a mousse, a shampoo, that as soon as they start to notice some red skin, it's their itchy seat season that they start to switch over to the chlorhexidine-based products and do it more often. If we can control these flares earlier and it's not just, oh, they're a disaster, I have to come in to see you, and now we have to do cytology and treat with oral antibiotics, we're all happier, right? The owner's happier because they have tools to try to get ahead of it, and then we're there if we need to be. You know, for us in a busy practice where we can't always get people in that quickly, I'm happier that the patient's better managed. But I do like that proactive therapy where, again, 
frequent bathing even if they're not infected, but using products that restore their skin barrier, but having the tools to react if needed. Maybe they're a dog who does great on immunotherapy, but we always know spring's a little difficult for them. They respond well to side a point. They know as soon as the pet starts itching, get in for a side a point. Don't wait until it's red inflamed skin. They're doing great on Apoquil, but Again, spring's always a little hard. They know they can go back to the twice daily dosing for a week or two if they need to. Just things that we can really educate our owners how to be proactive with can be so, so helpful in managing these patients so that when they do have a flare, they can get ahead of it. If not, again, we are there for them. But it is amazing how if you educate owners, give them a plan, like here's what you do when things are going well. Here's what you start to do if we start to flare it gives them empowerment. It helps the pet so we can start to get things used ahead of time. It's also a really nice gift. So we have them doing frequent topicals, right? Like a weekly bath with a maintenance shampoo. They're examining the skin a bit more too, which can be nice that they can catch these issues earlier. So I think there's a lot of way that we can be very proactive in our management. And I've always strived for that, but I've been more intentional of really breaking it down for owners, breaking it down in my discharge. Like just know you can do this this if they have a flare. This is the product I want you to use when you notice more red, irritated, you know, crusty skin versus this is just our maintenance uh, therapy. And it really clicks for owners to know that, that yeah, I expect they're going to probably flare. That's normal. Even for a patient I manage as a dermatologist, flares happen. So what can I do to be proactive for the owner, to get them looking at the skin more, to pick up on patterns, to know what works for them and what doesn't work for them, and to know there are tools that they can do at home. They don't necessarily have to rush to me right away. And if we catch it earlier, they might not have to, but I am here if there is a flare that they cannot control with the plan we have in place. So just, again, being really intentional with that, making sure owners understand that. Here's our maintenance. Here's our flare protocol. Here's what you can do right away. Notice these things earlier. So hopefully we don't get to the point they have to go on something like systemic antimicrobials. So just to review again, the things that I have learned or been implementing a bit better more recently. One, utilizing scientifically proven skin supplements and skin supportive diets. Two, how to do venomous, in, venomous insect testing and desensitize for venomous insects so our patients and, and clients don't have to live in fear. Three, upping my game and how I, even as a dermatologist, do immunotherapy through things like IV fluorescein testing in cats, uh, rush immunotherapy for injectable immunotherapy or other modalities like sublingual and topical. Uh, and then finally, how to really communicate with my owners, how to be proactive, not always just reactive with their allergy management. So I'm always learning. I'm going to be learning forever, even in my specialty of how to practice better. My hope is, as I learn, is I can help you so that you can have fun with dermatology and manage these patients better because I know you're seeing a ton of derm in general practice. I hope that is helpful. You know, if you're watching on YouTube, drop any comments below of what you have learned that maybe I have not covered. And I can't wait to see you on the next episode of the Derm Vet Podcast.